This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944 8344. That's 944 8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. Vsh.org. And I'd like to welcome you to the monthly lecture of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. We are a not-for-profit volunteer organization founded in 1990 for the purpose of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education. We're among the largest vegetarian societies in the country with approximately 2,000 members. It's now time for tonight's guest. We're delighted to have with us Dr. Michael Greger, a founding member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. He is a physician, author, and internationally recognized speaker on nutrition, food safety, and public health issues. He has lectured at the Conference on, on World Affairs, the International Bird Flu Summit, the National Institutes of Health. He's testified before Congress, and he was invited as an expert witness in the defense of Oprah Winfrey in the infamous meat defamation trial, which many of us remember. He's a graduate of Cornell University School of Agriculture and Tufts University School of Medicine. Currently, he serves as Director of Public Health and Animal Agriculture at the Humane Society of the United States. Tonight, he will discuss the latest in clinical nutrition. Please welcome Dr. Michael Greger. I guess we can put this back. Every year, I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal in the world. Why do I do this? Masochism? No. Time on my hands? Definitely no. Because when it comes to nutrition, I'm not interested in opinion. I'm not interested in beliefs. I'm not interested in dogma, vegetarian or otherwise. I'm interested in the science. What does the best available data show right now? Most everything you're going to see in this presentation tonight was published in the peer-reviewed scientific nutrition literature over the last two years. So this is true the kind of latest in, in cutting edge nutritional science, the stuff that won't even make it into the dietitian textbooks for another few years. Now in that time there were 12,000 articles published in the peer-reviewed um, medical literature on nutrition. 12,000 articles which I sifted through for the most groundbreaking, the most landmark practical work and I could just go on and on about how this new study showed this, that new study showed that, or I could somehow compile all this new research into a quiz show format. In a few moments I'm going to ask everyone to stand up and the first game we're going to play is called Harmful, Harmless or Helpful. I'll throw up a food item. You'll all be standing up and with a show of hands you'll guess whether what I have pictured, good for you, bad for you, or neither good nor bad based on the best science over the last year or two. If you get it right, you get to remain standing, go on to the next round. If you get it wrong, you, get to, you have to sit down. And we'll keep going and see who the last person is standing. <laughs> Any questions before we begin? Doesn't anybody want to know what they win? The last person standing each game will win a special CD-ROM I created containing all the full text PDFs of all the articles I'm going to talk about tonight. Your own personal nutrition library on a disc, the latest and greatest, including about 425 articles I wasn't able to get to, not for sale. You have to win it. All right, you ready? Everybody up. First up, 
Asp, new research on pregnant women in aspartame, what's typically in diet sodas, but this says aspartame. How many people think the latest science suggests that aspartame is harmful? Raise your hand. How many think no, it's harmless? And how many think they found some secret hidden healthy benefits to it? Anybody? So harmful, in fact, that leading scientists are petitioning the FDA to have it pulled from market. So anyone who voted harmless or helpful, please sit down. We'll go on to the next round. What about you're sitting at your um, favorite dining establishment. The wait staff offers to come over and crack some black pepper onto your salad. What do you say? All right, is black pepper harmful, harmless, or helpful? Who thinks black pepper is not good for you, harm, harmful? How many people think that, well, it's not bad for you, but not necessarily good for you either, harmless? How many think, no, black pepper is actually a health-promoting substance? And indeed, new research shows that black pepper, oh, well, for if you inject the human equivalent of a half cup of black pepper into the veins of mice, they don't do so good. They die slow agonizing deaths. But what does the human data show? And the human data shows very specifically it has anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, um, uh, anti-mutagenic effects. When it comes to having that heart-to-heart -heart with your pet mouse about shooting up, though, tell her just say no. All right, there are a bunch of exotic new fruits out there, like noni juice. Well, for 40 bucks a bottle, it better be good for you, right? Who thinks, I mean, ugly darn thing, but uh, harmful? Who thinks harmful? Who thinks harmless? Who thinks helpful? Well, it is a fruit, so it does have some antioxidants. Uh, no more than apples or bananas, which are kind of pretty pitiful, though. Oh, yeah, and the stuff may kill you. Shut down this poor 24-year-old woman's liver. Best to stay away from anything sold by a multi-level marketing network, in my opinion. And we have one, two, three remaining contestants. Speaking of multi-level marketing networks, Herbalife, $100 billion corporation, likes to show you before and after pictures like this. This is the after picture they don't want you to see. The case reports keep coming in. Herbalife induced liver injury. Um, Herbalife induced acute hepatotoxicity, severe hepatotoxicity or liver damage, um, something I encourage people to stay away from. Three remaining contestants. What about a handful of nuts every day? Fatty, calorically dense, but harmful? What do you think? Harmful, harmless, or helpful? Helpful. We got a helpful. We got two helpfuls. What do you think? Anyone want to shout out any advice for our remaining contestant here? What do you think? Helpful. All right, we got three helpfuls, and indeed, a one handful of nuts every day is not only helpful, but cut your risk of having a heart attack in half, the number one killer for both men and women every single year since 1919, and cut your risk of dying from a heart attack in half. A um, handful of nuts every day. Now scientists believe that the, oh, don't nuts make you fat though? People have that concern. Well, this is the latest study on the subject. Added two handfuls of nuts, almonds in this case, to uh, people's daily diet and no weight gain. In fact, there have been 20 studies in the English language and human history on nuts and weight gain, and zero out of 20. All 20 showed zero weight gain, and we're not sure why, whether they boost your metabolism or just violate the second law of thermodynamics. Who knows? Who cares? Nuts will not make you fat. Eat them every day. So in the latest study was two handfuls of nuts and no weight gain. Now scientists think that the healthfulness of nuts may be in part because of their vitamin E content. So why not just forget the nuts and take the vitamin E supplements instead? Who thinks that scientists have discovered that that's a bad idea? Harmful, harmless, or helpful? Vitamin E supplements. What do you think? Well, let's start over here. Give you some time to think. We got a harmful vitamin E supplements. We got two harmfuls. Harmless. 
and we have a harmless and according to um, this landmark article published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, vitamin E supplements increase all-cause mortality, meaning you take vitamin E supplements, you live on average a shorter life. You are in fact paying to live a shorter life. Two remaining contestants, same study, but this time with vitamin A. Shorter life, same life, or longer life in terms of longevity? What do you think? Same life. Same life, same life and we have no winners this round. Shorter life. Vitamin A supplement takers lived on average a shorter life. Everyone up for the next round? What about the plant-based form of vitamin A though, beta carotene in pill form. How many people think beta carotene supplements shorten people's lives? How many people say it doesn't do anything to your lifespan? And how many people think it, it will extend your lifespan? Beta carotene supplements every day decrease your lifespan. Increased cancer rates, all sorts of bad things. Okay, uh, in terms of uh, one more supplement though, in terms of longevity before we move on, and that is vitamin D. How many people of those remaining standing think vitamin D supplements decrease one's lifespan? How many people say it doesn't do anything to your lifespan? And how many people think those taking vitamin D supplements actually live longer lives? And indeed, the only supplement ever to show to actually extend one's lifespan, vitamin D. We, now vitamin D is not made by plants, it's not made by, um, it's made by animals like ourselves and when we're exposed to sunlight, unfortunately everyone cannot live in paradise down in Hawaii. And so if any of you know uh, folks that aren't below the Tropic of Cancer, uh, they may want to supplement during the winter months where no matter how long one sunbathes naked in January and February from where I am in D.C., you will not make enough vitamin D because the sun's, angles are at such a, sun's rays are at such an angle. However, here, 15 minutes of midday sun on face and forearms for someone with light skin is all the vitamin D you need. If, however, you stay inside and don't go out, then you may want to indeed supplement your diet. All right. For those of you standing, remember who you are. You can sit back down. And I'll get just you back up for the next round. I just want to note the two um, vitamins one can't get from a healthy diet. Vitamin D is one of them. And this is the other. Anybody? I heard it over here. Vitamin B12. It's the only other vitamin not made by plants, not made by animals, it's either made by tiny microbes that blank the earth. We used to get all the vitamin B12 we need drinking out of a mountain stream or well water, but now we chlorinate our water supply to kill off any bacteria. So we don't get a lot of B12 in our water anymore. We don't get a lot of cholera either. So that's a good thing. But the problem is because we live in this kind of sanitized world, um, for good reason, um, we need to get B12 from someplace. The bacteria does um, contaminate some of the animals um, whose uh, products people eat um, and can be a source for those um, not eating plant-based diets. But for people who are trying to eat healthy, eating plant-based diets, one needs to get B12 from someplace. What's the worst that can happen, though? If you don't get B12, well, let me just review the medical literature over a 12-month period. I like to call it my B12 deficiency house of horror. If you happen to flip over last summer's issue of the Nutrition Journal, Nutrition, you'll see a titles like this. Irreversible subacute sclerotic combined degeneration of spinal cord in a vegan subject. And yes, it's just as bad as it sounds. If you uh, have good vision, you can see 57-year-old man, member of a vegan cult, it says. Can you blame the doctor, though? Look what non-B12 supplemented veganism did to this poor guy. He can't really see. Rotted his spinal cord from the inside out. Paralyzed. They immediately gave him B12. And he's not going to die. And he didn't die. But he's probably never going to walk for the rest of his life. And it's so easy, so easy to get enough B12, either fortified foods or supplements. And on the handout I have over there on the table, it gives all the details. And be certainly happy to answer questions afterwards. 
Um, now, but for those of you who are eating vegetarian but not taking a vitamin B12 supplement or eating B12 fortified foods, you're certainly welcome to do whatever you want as a young vegetarian woman. For example, you can, your toes can turn purple. You can develop a polymorphic maculopapular lesion. Your nails can turn black. Your hair can turn white. You can see this woman, they gave her B12. Her hair started to grow back in normal. B12 supplements also make you put on lipstick, evidently. Uh, but... Uh, you can be like this. Uh, you can suffer cognitive decline or be like um, this poor lifelong vegetarian who um, became suicidally depressed because of B12 deficiency or even get yourself thrown into a psychiatric institution as a paranoid schizophrenic because of the B12 deficiency induced hallucinations and delusions that this poor person was experiencing. But not taking B12 in pregnancy is not okay. Infantile seizures, no fun. Vegan babies should be a lot of things, but floppy is not one of them. Leading these uh, negligent vegans led this year, uh, last year to the European uh, Pediatric Nutrition Association encouraging children not to be on vegan diets. Even Dr. Spock in his latest edition said all children should be raised vegan. It's just they need to get their B12 just like everybody. And that's everybody, not just those eating vegetarian. It turns out that the bioavailability of B12 is not what we thought it was. And so the, there's been renewed calls for all grain products in the United States to be fortified with B12 like they do in other countries like in Israel. In Israel, by law, all pasta, all bread has to have B12 in it, recognizing that everybody is not getting enough B12. And if we do that here in the United States, as I hope we will in a few years, I can close the kind of door on my house of horrors and we'll never have this problem hopefully ever again until then though i encourage people to make sure they get their b12 enough preaching back to the game let's get those who were standing up before let's get you back up what about the quintessential health food alfalfa sprouts how can they possibly be bad am i just throwing you a curveball here what do you think who says alfalfa sprouts harmful never eat them who says harmless? That eh, kind of balances out. And who says they're alfalfa sprouts? Of course they're good for you, helpful. And it looks like we have another winner. As dictated by the ADA, FDA, CDC, no alfalfa sprouts, none ever. Congratulations. Wait a second, why? Because there's been a number of serious outbreaks of food poisoning linked to alfalfa sprouts. So, for example, last year there was not one, not two, not three, but a hundred cases of salmonella poisoning linked to sprouts here in the United States. Now, of course, we do. And now, uh, salmonella can be a gift that can keep on giving. You get salmonella once, and you, you can, it can trigger chronic arthritis called reactive arthritis for the rest of your life after getting sick once. Now, we do have to put this in contact, context, though. Last year, sprouts caused 100 cases of, uh, of salmonella poisoning, whereas eggs, for example, caused 182. 1,000 cases of salmonella poisoning. Now, you don't hear the CDC saying don't eat eggs, but they do say no raw eggs, no runny eggs. In fact, the official CDC recommendations, no sunny side up, no over easy. Eggs have to be cooked hard to kill off any of the bugs. And similarly, if you, you know, boiled your sprouts, they'd be okay too, but that's kind of gross. The uh, troubling uh, data keeps coming in. How much of the potentially deadly E. coli 015787, that kind of jack-in-the-box E. coli, is found in ground beef, sprouts, and mushrooms in the United States? Well, none was found in mushrooms, but one out of just 91 burgers in the United States has this potentially deadly bacteria, and one out of just 67 containers of alfalfa sprouts. So um, I agree with the CDC, encourage people to stay away from sprouts. All right, everybody up for the next round. What about broccoli sprouts, though? Check out this study. 
This is some person's forearm where they burned with a UV laser here and here after presumably paying them lots of money. But on this side, if you can see, um, much lighter, they first rubbed some broccoli sprouts on their skin. It seemed to protect the DNA from the damage that caused the inflammation over on this side. They thought, well, maybe it's just kind of a sunblock effect. So they repeated the study, but this time rubbed some uh, um, um, broccoli sprouts on this side, washed it off, waited three days, and did it again. And as you can see, or barely see, um, on this side, it's much lighter. There's less inflammation. There's less DNA damage. Something in the broccoli sprouts three days earlier washed off seem to protect those cells. But what about the food poisoning risk? Well, five million cases of broccoli sprouts were tested recently for bugs. And what do you think? How many people think ah, they just found too many of these bugs that uh, broccoli sprouts are harmful? and that we should never eat them, or at least raw. How many people think, well, it all kind of balances out, harmless? And how many think, no, they found very few bugs and that broccoli sprouts are helpful? And indeed, less than one in a thousand containers was contaminated, so go for it, I say. Food poisoning aside, though, what about that egg? All right. Now, I'm not talking an omelet here. I mean, certainly high in cholesterol, but just one a single egg a day. Harmful, harmless, or helpful to you, not the chicken. All right. How many people say one egg a day is harmful to one's health? And how many think, well, think, well, not harmful, but kind of let's harm less one egg a day? And how many think, no, one a day, helpful, good for you? All right. And the answer is, in, is that uh, an egg a day is indeed helpful if you want to die an early death. Here's the, um, this is the Harvard physician study. 20,000 Harvard physicians studied for 20 years, and those eating just a single egg a day had significantly greater all-cause mortality, meaning the more eggs one eats, the shorter, on average, one lives. Whereas this interesting study of 40,000 women um, done around the same time showed that eating oatmeal every morning, at least for women, extends one's lifespan. Give me an E. Give me a G. Give me another G. What's that spell? All right, moving right along. All right, what about two cups of filtered coffee along with that oatmeal? Now, historically, coffee's been a confusing story. Originally, uh, coffee consumption was linked to bladder and ovarian cancer, but that turned out because the coffee drinkers were also smokers, and when you actually separated it out, we, uh, there was, we lost the cancer connection. Now, we do th now coffee can uh, cause heartburn, worse than osteoporosis, but may actually protect against Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's and diabetes. So, to sip or not, to sip, what do you say based on the latest data? Two cups filtered coffee, who says harmful? Harmful, who says harmful? Who says harmless? And who says no, actually good for you, helpful? Two cups of filtered coffee a day is helpful for your health. Now note I said filtered coffee. There actually are some substances in coffee that, that uh, worsen your cholesterol, but they're actually filtered out by a plain paper filter. Um, so I'm not talking about French pass coffee or espresso, but for filtered coffee, two cups a day is indeed helpful. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six remaining contestants. Black coffee, though, or black tea, which is healthier? Who says coffee is healthier? Marijuana, the next villain on the lung cancer battlefield, indeed, smoking a single joint is equivalent, from a lung cancer standpoint, to smoking an entire pack of cigarettes. But anyway, everyone up for the next round. All right. So not all herbal teas are good for you. What about um, red tea? You've heard of black tea, green tea. What about red tea? Who says harmful? Who says harmless? Who says helpful? And indeed, wonderful stuff. What about another African herbal tea, honeybush tea? Who says harmful? Who says harmless? Who says helpful? Wonderful stuff. 
All right, now this is honeybush, just to give you some sense. Honeybush compared to red compared to green in terms of antioxidant content, so green is still best. And uh, green tea has more than just antioxidants. It has something called theanine, which not only does all sorts of other things, but also boosts uh, human uh, gamma delta T lymphocyte function. So not only decreases your risk of cancer, but also likely your risk of the common cold as well. Next up, soy foods like tofu. Who says harmful? Who says harmless? Who says helpful? Well, if you feed the equivalent of 300 cups of soy milk to a Chinese dwarf hamster, who could hurt a hamster? Right? Well, they don't do so good. But what does the human data show? Well, just in the last few months, eating soy cut your diabetes risk in half, help double your weight loss for those on the diet, drop your bad cholesterol 14%, where's 14%, and even just adding soy milk to your daily diet has measurably beneficial effects on cardiovascular risk. So soy food's indeed helpful for one's health, but bumping it up a notch, what about soy foods for women with active, you can't read this, active estrogen receptor positive breast cancer? Now, the phytoestrogens in soy, these weak estrogens that pro actually protect your um, body's tissue against the more powerful endogenous ovarian estrogens, contribute to the prevention of breast cancer. So in terms of prevention, um, the only question really has been, uh, these are the two most recent studies, does soy consumption decrease your risk of breast cancer 30% or decrease your risk of getting breast cancer 50%? But what if you already have breast cancer? Do we want to be eating any kind of estrogenic type compounds at all? That was one of the most controversial areas of human nutrition until this study. Soy consumption and breast cancer survival on Long Island took women with breast cancer, two groups, eating soy, not eating soy, and just asked who lived longer. All right. Who thinks those eating soy lived shorter lives? Harmful. How many people think both groups live the same? So it didn't really matter if they ate it, soy or not. And how many people think those eating soy actually lived longer with breast cancer and indeed lived longer, significantly longer? So not only do soy foods prevent breast cancer in the first place, but those eating soy with breast cancer live on average longer lives. All right. Thought the last question was hard. What about meat? Harmful, harmless, or helpful? Overall, in one's diet, who says harmful? Who says harmless? Who says helpful? And the answer is harmful. And if you all standing up want to have a seat while I explain, I will get you back up for the next round. And the way I would explain is to say that food is a package deal. There are lots of nutrients in beef for example. They're plant eaters. Right? Lots of nutrients in beef, but even though they say you can have it your way, you can't walk into a Burger King, order a Whopper, and, and say, uh, uh, yeah, could I get that uh, with no artery-clogging saturated fat, uh, no cholesterol, hold the hormones? It doesn't work that way because food is a package deal. And the baggage that comes along with the nutrients in meat include cancer. Two Harvard studies um, wrapped into one. A hundred thousand people um, surveyed those eating bacon and or chicken increased their risk of bladder cancer, um, doubled their risk of bladder cancer. Same with pancreatic cancer. You do not want to die of pancreatic cancer. Long Island women eating lots of barbecue, 74 percent increased risk of breast cancer. Uh, now they thought that it was the kind of the frying, the grilling that really cancers up the beet, but no, in this study a few months earlier for endometrial cancer, at least it doesn't matter how one cooks the meat. And in this study, those eating the you know, so-called white meat, fish and chicken, actually had the highest rates of cancer compared to anyone. Right? Um, another 35,000 women studied conclusion. Women, both pre- and postmenopausal, consume the most meat, highest risk of breast cancer. I point out the study, just uh, it's interesting, the acknowledgments. You can see that an earlier analysis of the study was funded by the Meat and Livestock Commission. Once they found out what the results were, though, they weren't quite enthusiastic in their support. 
This is the latest study on breast cancer and meat. They found that breast cancer risk increased 50% for every additional 100 grams of daily meat consumption. That's like one drumstick. Right? So 50% increased risk for every daily drumstick. Right? And these are just the brand new studies. One can go back in time to 1686, to one of the earliest medical texts in human history, and they, you can see they've known about the cancer um, and meat connection for centuries. The most authoritative report on diet and cancer in history, published in 1997, the World Cancer Research Fund Tome, reviewed every study on diet and cancer ever published and concluded thusly. Choose a diet, predominantly plant-based, rich in variety of fruits, vegetables, nuts, beans, minimally processed starchy foods, meaning whole grains. So, fruits, vegetables, nuts, beans, and whole grains, that's what thousands of studies point towards for um, cancer prevention, a whole foods, vegan, or plant-based diet. Right. Well, that was 1997, though. They've since updated. They, review, they released, um, at the end of 2007, their 10-year update to review all the thousands of studies that have been published since then, and they came to the same conclusion, but found even more uh, evidence implicating obesity, alcohol consumption, and meat um, in uh, cancer risk, particularly processed meats, cold cuts, bacon, hot dogs. In fact, there was even a study on hot dogs um, last year um, uh, in the uh, Journal of uh, Diagnostic Pathology, a forensic study answering the question, what the heck is actually in them? It was like a CSI episode, and what they found... They found bone and blood vessels and nerves and cartilage and, and, and skin. But here's the kicker. Um, the amount of actual meat, less than 10%. All right. So what, what was the uh, meat industry's response to this devastating new cancer report? Well, the beef industry spin was that the report was bad advice and that another scientific study uh, found no link between um, uh, between meat and cancer. A study, in their words, that was independent and comprehensive. All right. All right, well, I tracked the study down. I was on to the, and in fact, they, they, you know, how the, they asked the question, how the World Cancer Research Fund report could come to a different conclusion is perplexing to the beef board. All right, well, here's the study to which they refer. I was on to the study like brown on rice. Let's do a, a comparison. The WCRF report looked at 7,000 studies. There's 500. That's still good. This had 537 pages. This one had four pages. This was written by nine independent teams of scientists from around the world and reviewed by 21 of the top cancer researchers in the world. This one was written by these two guys. You can't see the it cuts off their cowboy hats. But um, times this took over five years, and this one uh, was done since last summer. Um, this one was overseen by the World Health Organization, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and funded by a leading cancer charity. Um, this other one was overseen by a for-profit scientist for hire firm, which had come out with previous reports downplaying the risks of asbestos, pesticides, and cigarette smoking. And who funded it? Well, all you have to do is look on the back here, and it was this independent study brought to you by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, perplexing, isn't it? All right, well, if you think that takes gall, wait till you see what the pork industry did. Smithfield, largest pork producer in the world, knew that this cancer report was coming, and so they launched their Deli for the Cure campaign, <laughs> donating five cents for each pound of meat sold, which the WCRF report found caused the most cancer towards early detection, so, if they, I mean, if they're going to give you cancer early, they might as well help you detect it early, too. That was very nice of them. Okay, let's get those that were up the last time. Let's get you back up to answer the question, what about dairy products, though? Again, overall, harmful, harmless, helpful. Who says harmful of those standing? Who says harmless? And who says helpful for one's diet overall? And the answer is harmful. And once again, remember who you are. Sit down while I explain. I will get you back up. And to explain the number one source of... You can sit down. The number one source of calcium in the American diet is dairy products. The number one source of artery-clogging saturated fat, however, in the American diet is not beef. It's dairy products. Number one allergen 
um, in the uh, food supply as well. So yes, cow's milk represents a substantial source of calcium, but it all depends on what baggage you want with your calcium, right? The calcium in dark green leafy vegetables like kale, collards, bok choy absorb twice as well as the calcium in milk. And as a bonus, you get the fiber and the folate and the you know, phytonutrients and the uh, bone health superstar vitamin K, none of which is found in dairy. The, the kind of bonus you get with dairy is the saturated butter fat and lactose and, and, uh, and cholesterol and antibiotics, pesticides, pus and manure. And if you're skeptical, when scientists test pasteurization protocols, they actually have to take the manure into account. Heat and activation of, meat, of milk are contaminated with infected feces. Um, to account for what happens naturally in the dairy industry, high concentrations of feces from infected cows were used to contaminate milk just to test their pasteurization protocols. There was even a pus study last year in the Journal of Dairy Science kind of to ask the age-old question, can you taste the pus? Well, the United States has the highest allowable pus cell concentration in the world, can allow 300 million pus cells per tall frosty glass. Now, the industry, however, has always argued that it doesn't matter how infected and inflamed the udders of our uh, factory farm dairy cows are because of pasteurization, right? It's cooked pus, so th there's no food safety risk. But what this question, but what this study did was, well, can you taste the difference? That is important to industry. Um, and so they made two vats of cheese, one with uh, U.S. milk and one conforming to the more stringent European standards. And the now with less pus cheese evidently tasted significantly better, at least according to this study. And speaking of pus, yes, zits. New Harvard study found um, so much significantly more um, acne in milk drinkers that it led a top dermatology journal to editorialize for what they call a no dairy diet, reducing dairy for anyone with acne to zero because of the hormone content in milk. Check out this study, semen quality of fertile U.S. males in relation to their mother's beef consumption during pregnancy. Meat is so packed with hormones that pregnant women eating meat um, can actually affect the development of their son's genital organs in utero such that when they grow up they actually have decreased fertility. So in effect meat eaters are at risk of having fewer grandchildren. Now we've seen um, this kind of uh, a milk and meat um, uh, data in terms of exposure of young children to these steroid endocrine disrupting hormones. Um, but this, for the first time uh, last year, we actually had some egg data. Someone measured the hormones in eggs, um, which had never been done before. Um, and so this is for both androgens and estrogens combined. And as you can see, here's meat, here's dairy. Eggs are off the charts, really. There's no such thing as hormone-free, you know, milk, meat, or eggs. All um, animals produce testosterone and estrogen, and those um, uh, steroids are deposited in their flesh and fluids. The question, though, are the levels high enough to have any kind of deleterious effect on young children who normally have very low levels of sex steroids in their bodies? Well, for estradiol, for example, the kind of tolerable upper daily safety limit set by the FDA is um, 65 uh, micrograms or, or millions of a gram um, for um, what's called estradiol, one of these powerful estrogen-like compounds. Well, so they just did a diet composition study where they just, what does the typical American you know, child eat in terms of animal products? And uh, they estimated that children would get around 100 a day. All right. Now, we do not yet know what the consequences of this are, but there's certainly concerns about um, cancer risk and uh, reproductive development. And interestingly, the hormone levels in eggs from um, factory farms is actually uh, significantly higher by a small fraction um, compared to um, chickens raised more humanely. All right, back to dairy. Harvard nurses study those eating dairy double their risk of having a heart attack or feed your kid lots of dairy and triple their risk of colorectal cancer 65 years later. So these were children that were fed dairy as kids 65 years later had triple the colorectal cancer risk compared to those that didn't have dairy as children. More dairy, more prostate cancer. More dairy, more testicular cancer. More dairy, more Parkinson's disease. 
And this is not a fluke. Um, every single study ever done on Parkinson's and dairy consumption found increased risk of Parkinson's um, uh, for those eating dairy. And the question is, why? What is in animal products that, that could be so toxic that could decrease your lifespan or you know, cause enough brain damage to trigger a disease like Parkinson's disease? Right? Well, in years past, we can start with the industrial carcinogens that build up in our meat supply. In the past, I've talked about these carcinogens. Um, chemical carcinogens, DDT, BCBs, dioxins, kind of crawling up the food chain, how um, the um, uh, levels of these um, uh, toxins um, are only one to, in vegetarians, are only one to two percent compared to um, the rest of the population. And again, for those you've seen uh, my talks over the year, none of this will be new to you. How U.S. Um, fast, um, how supermarket surveys show that fish is the worst in terms of both PCBs and dioxins combined, and eating vegan um, is the best. How U.S. fast food, just a toxic kind of witch's brew of, uh, of various carcinogens, including um, uh, DDT. And in terms of the levels, um, here's a FDA daily limit for children. As you can see, we exceed that um, quite readily because these toxins build up in animal fat. Um, but worse even than uh, um, McDonald's or Pizza Hut is taking our children to um, Kentucky Fried Chicken where we are exposing them, so, them to levels of toxic waste um, not seen anywhere else. But I mean, these studies were done 10 years ago. Thankfully, the levels of these toxins are in decline. Agent Orange was banned in 1970, DDT banned in 72, lead gas 73, PCB 79. We're seeing the levels of intake go down around the world, seeing um, the levels actually found in our bodies go down around the world. These flame retardants in U.S. food, where is it found? Where are the top sources, if you want to stay away from this stuff? The top sources were, <clears throat> excuse me, dairy, beef, bacon, fish. Once again, chicken so contaminated it screws up my graph. Squish the rest down and chicken fat. Um, what about those that don't eat these kind of products? Well, similar in this study, similar to previous findings of low dioxin levels in vegans, um, vegans had lower PBDE levels too, and the longer people go without consuming animal products, the lower the levels drop. Check out this study here if you can read it. This is a vegan PBDE level. So as you can see, this is years without consuming animal products. It may take 20 years, but eventually our bodies can kind of rid ourselves of these kind of toxins on our own, right? Now, although the levels of, of dioxins and PCBs are in decline, there is one dietary source that still remains a threat, and that is fish. Everything eventually washes down into the sea. Yes, you can get some from horse meat, right? Um, uh, here's, the, uh, here's the tolerable upper daily limit, according to the World Health Organization, one trillionth of a gram. Um, and as you can see, um, just eating dairy, and you're already skirting the max, but uh, at any level of, of, of fish intake, and you are way over the top. Right? Now, everyone agrees that these long-chain omega-3, these marine um, uh, fatty acids like DHA, found in fish flesh, are healthy. But given the industrial contaminants in fish, um, as we see in, in food, food and Chemical Toxicology, if people actually get these long-chain omega-3 fatty acids from fish, the majority of people would exceed these safety guidelines for these dioxins and dioxin-like substances. And interestingly, just like in fish, um, farmed fish, these factory farmed fish, have significantly higher levels. In fact, for every chemical studied, um, uh, um, farm fish have more DDT, more of these other banned pesticides, 10 times more PCBs, 10 times more dioxins than wild caught fish. There have been dozens of these cost benefit analyses recently, right? Because there's good stuff, there's bad stuff, there's nutrient and contaminant trade offs, right? A fish consumption provides nutrients, but all fish also contains methylmercury, this known neurotoxin. Right? Um, and so the more fish you eat, the more fish you eat, the more omega-3s you get. But the more fish you eat, 
the more mercury you get. And mercury is a cardiac toxin as well. So the DHA, these long-chain omega-3 fatty acids and fish fats, is decreasing your risk of heart attack. The mercury in that very same fish is increasing your risk of having a heart attack. So they do all these kind of comparisons. They say, well, hey, salmon has less mercury than tuna, but at the same time, tuna has less of these dioxins than salmon. The only truly healthy fish is some fanciful creature made out of dark green leafy vegetables. Once upon a time, routine childhood vaccinations contained a mercury-containing preservative called thimerosal. You know, when I was also, I was always, when, you know, parents would come into my office and parents who fed their kids fish and said they, and they refused vaccinations because they didn't want to expose their children to mercury. Well, the amount of mercury that goes into one's body in a single serving of canned tuna, which is about half a can, the amount of mercury found in, in a, a half a can of tuna is equivalent to getting injected with how many thimerosal-containing vaccines? One. Hundred. A hundred vaccines for every single serving of tuna. So sure, dietary exposure can uh, harm child development, but it goes on to say, but look, if they don't get these uh, long-chain omega-3 fatty acids, um, which are so good for us, then uh, you know, that's going to be a detriment. So what they do is they get out their calculators, and in the size of a city about New York, um, they say, well, look, if pregnant women eat lots of fish, um, the DHA is so helpful for brain development, we would improve the lives of 200, improve 209,000 years of children's lives. However, the mercury is so toxic that it would, uh, um, it would damage 203,000 years of children's lives. So they do the math, comes out positive by a hair, and so you hear such and such medical authority on TV saying, eat fish, the, the benefits outweigh the risks. Now, but of course, this is not talking, this doesn't take into account the PCBs, dioxins, which push it over to the other side. But more importantly, why accept any risk at all? By getting our um, omega-3s from plant sources, we can get all the benefits without the risk, all the benefits without the hundreds of thousands of years of brain damage um, for our children. Kind of reminds me of kind of dairy, the dairy and calcium thing. In all these studies where dairy is linked to Parkinson's and cancer, at the end of the study, they, they don't say stop drinking milk. They say, yeah, all this terrible stuff, but if people stop drinking milk, where are they going to get calcium? As if the only source of calcium was dairy. Right? Where do you think the cows get it from in the first place? Plants. Right? And we can too. Um, and the same thing with these omega-3 fatty acids. Where do you think the fish get it from? They get it from plants, and we can too. These tiny little plants called golden algae. Right? This is what it looks like. It's grown organically, so no heavy metals, industrial toxins. It's grown bloodlessly. Um, you know, Charlie always looked a little happier on the commercials for some reason. It's grown um, uh, sustainably, so we are not contributing to the extinction of our ocean wildlife. It's grown hygienically. So you don't have to hear me talk about this new tapeworm discovered in North America, this fish tapeworm. I'll give you a hint, though. These are not noodles. Not as bad, perhaps, as pork tapeworm shown here sticking out or here literally eating someone's brain. Pork tapeworms are the number one cause of epilepsy on the planet. Number one cause of adult onset seizures, pork tapeworms, which are infecting people's brains. Speaking of fish hygiene, in April's Journal of Food Protection last year, a year ago, they swabbed sushi across the country for fecal bacteria. And the National Food Standards Guidelines for Maximum Fecal Bacteria Allowed in Ready-to-Eat Foods is 30,000. How much was found in sushi? As you can see, uh, lots of fecal bacteria found. However, they also looked at vegetarian sushi, both um, avocado and cucumber rolls. How much fecal bacteria was found on them? Zero. Zero fecal. You know, for a moment there, I forgot that avocados don't have rectums, right? (laughs) This wasn't because people were touching them. It's because it came from the fish itself. All right. Anyway, so all the benefits, none of the risks. Um, um, the studies have found that the algae-based um, DHA is, is 100% bioequivalent to that, that found in fish flesh. 
Um, so you can get your long chain omega-3 fatty acids this way or this way, right? Yes, people who don't eat animals have very low levels of these industrial toxins within their bodies, but they also have very low levels of these long chain omega-3 fatty acids. So I recommend everybody take three, 250 to 300 milligrams of microalgae-based DHA every day. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone, right? Because certainly fish eaters um, aren't getting enough. And if they did, then they would be um, getting way too many toxins. There are at least, um, there are seven sources, I think, on the market now. Diva makes one, um, um, Omega Zen makes one. Um, uh, Spectrum brand, uh, uh, V-Pure makes one, Udo's oil also has a microalgae-based DHA, and again, um, toxin-free and has all the omega-3s one needs. And again, um, the details are all on the handout. Now, we can make DHA ourselves from short-chain omega-3 fatty acids found in flax seeds and walnuts, um, but probably not enough for optimum health. However, flax seeds still wonderful stuff. Recently got compared to the leading pharmacological treatment. Um, oh, uh, uh, just to, I'm sorry to back up for a second. Um, these long chain omega 3 fatty acids, particularly important for breastfeeding in pregnant women, found to um, improve visual acuity, um, problem solving, and um, recently also uh, bumped their IQ at four years old as well. Anyway, flax seeds, recently compared to the leading pharmacological treatment for enlarged prostate glands, um, tamsulosin here on this side, maybe $300 a year compared to flax seeds, maybe $10 a year, um, found to be 100% equivalent. Flax, one tablespoon of flax seeds every day work just as well as the drug, so I guess it all comes down to side effects, of which there are a whole bunch, um, including dizziness and nausea and all sorts of things. But there are um, side effects to flax seeds, too. Side effects include improving your cholesterol and blood sugar, um, improves your, um, drops your blood pressure, and controls one's hot flashes as well, although not a big problem for prostate sufferers, typically. <laughs> it may even help with arthritis. Fish seal and flaxseed oils lessen joint pain. So we have another choice. We can kill and grind up her. We can kill and grind up him, or we can kill and grind up this, right? The horror, right? Okay. So, burgers aren't so good for you, but what about the fries? However, you look down at fast food french fries, and you're exceeding that safety limit by about 30,000%. Now, back then, it was considered a probable carcinogen because it causes cancer in lab rats, but we didn't know, we didn't have any human data, but I told people, look, let's be better safe than sorry, stay away from potato chips and french fries, and in five or six years, we'll know, we'll have, the, they're starting human studies now, and we'll know, well, we finally have some human studies, and let's get those who were standing up last, let's get you back up for the next round, and what do you think? Now that we have human studies back, who thinks that eating potato chips and french fries is bad for you? Who thinks it's, well, it's not, it's harmless. And who thinks it's helpful? Well, acrylamide, finally, um, we have some human data, and it has been linked to human endometrial cancer, human ovarian cancer, and human breast cancer. So I encourage people to continue to stay away from potato chips and french fries. This, however, remains okay. Nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day minimum. Those are the current federal guidelines. But yes, what are the healthiest plant foods to eat, though? Um, uh, the World Health Organization says millions of people, literally, every year, dying from inadequate fruit and vegetable intake, almost as much as cigarette smoking. We should eat fruits and vegetables as if our lives depend on it, because guess what? They do. Which are the healthiest ones to stuff our face with? Well... If you came to my earlier lectures, I said blueberries were number one fruit, kale number one vegetable, based on a study of 40 common fruits and vegetables at Tufts way back in 2002. But then this study came out um, later that year that looked at uh, over 100 dietary plants, and we had some new, and blueberries got their little blue butts kicked down to number seven. No one had ever looked at walnuts before the new antioxidant champion with pomegranates nipping at its heels, but then 2003 came along, whew, looked at herbs and spices, and once again, number one antioxidant substance, cloves, fresh oregano, here's to put it in perspective, oregano, 40 times more antioxidants than blueberries, a thousand times more than basically everything Americans eat, and cloves way up on the roof, couldn't fit in my graph, but finally, 
the definitive answer, your tax dollars at work? Over 300 plant food studies, and we have some new champions. Number one period was cloves. Number one antioxidant substance on the planet. Um, in terms of gram for gram, though, this is by weight, right? You can eat a whole handful of walnuts, no problem, right? Handful of cloves, not so easy. So a serving of, of nuts is actually more healthful than a serving of cloves, which is just a tiny pinch. So what I did was I ranked the top dozen, based on this new study, uh, by serving in terms of antioxidants per serving. And so here we go, very quickly to run through here. First, let me just compare. This is basically the antioxidant content of everything Americans eat. Corns, lettuce, peas, potatoes, bananas. All right, just to give you a reference point, number 12, top antioxidant food on the planet that we know of, a single serving of cocoa powder, tablespoon of cocoa powder. So adding, so making your morning smoothie into a chocolate smoothie dramatically increases nutritional benefits. Half cup of blueberries, number 11. Didn't even make, blueberries didn't even make the top 10 this year. Number nine, a pomegranate. Number eight, a black plum. Number seven, um, a, a half cup of, of pecans, sorry. One pear came in at number six, surprising. A half cup of cranberries. One single humble apple. Um, a teaspoon of cinnamon, an artichoke. That was a huge um, upset. Um, and this is number two, goji berries. This is where they came in, a half cup of goji berries. Second most antioxidant-packed food on the planet per serving. But if you're looking for the most antioxidants per serving in any food, you wouldn't be going to the Himalayas for goji. You'd be going to Brazil for acai berries. You may have seen this. In fact, I was just at uh, the co-op. Um, and saw that they didn't indeed have these, but it was five bucks. Right? Five bucks for a pound of this acai pulp. Is it worth it? Well, I ranked, given our current economic situation, I ranked the top antioxidants, not just per serving, but per dollar to find the best bargains. And here we go. Pecans, almost 5,000, over 5,000 antioxidant units per a dollar. Uh, fantastic, but there's even better. There's where apples come in. Here's goji's. Goji's super antioxidant-packed, but so expensive. You can get more antioxidants for your money with cranberries, um, with artichokes, or with acai berries. So there's acai comes in. So if you're willing to spend the money to eat one of these every day to keep people like me away, then it's worth it. It really is worth it um, to get the acai berries. Um, maybe five, ten times more expensive, but 40 times more antioxidants. A few better bargains to go. There comes cloves. There comes cinnamon. Number one, though... What an upset. Number one best antioxidant bargain on the planet, period, bar none, purple cabbage, red cabbage. Go buy one, put it in your crisper, slice off shreds and put it in whatever you're eating. When it's done, go out, buy another one. Can't beat it by anything in the world. Quick recipe to get more spices, these amazing spices into your diet. Um, uh, 10 ounces of tofu, pumpkin, uh, one to two dozen pitted dates, depending how sweet you like it. Then as many of these antioxidant pox pack spices you can possibly put in. Throw it in a whole wheat pie crust, bake it at 350 till it's done, and you have healthy pumpkin pie, health-promoting pumpkin pie. It's just fruits, fruits, vegetables, soy, and ounce per ounce, the most powerful antioxidant substances on the planet. The more pie you eat, the healthier you are then we should all eat a B12 fortified whole foods vegan diet. Thank you very much. Hi, thanks for being here tonight. If you have time, help us put away the chairs. Enjoy the vegan refreshments. And remember, no food on the dance floor. No food in the wood floor, please. Thank you. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344 or visit our website at www.vsh.org, vsh.org.